MHO Talk Show. I am H O Talk Show, Sir Charles. Miss Max. And the booth in the building one more again. That's right. Back like we never left, Miss Max, to continue to edutain the people. And what better way could we edutain the people than by having a good doctor in the house? Is there a doctor in the house? <laughs> yes, there is. <laughs> is there a professor in the house? Yes, yeah, because um, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, we know we present to some and introduce to others, none other. Uh, then Dr. J. Lo Warman. And thank you for joining us today, Dr. Warman. Thank you so much for having mm-hmm. me. Thanks I'm for being here. So excited to be here. And I can't wait to just get into it. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Um, I feel like it's been long overdue. <laughs> long overdue. Long overdue. So, you know, we're going to get into a little bit of that because I believe that your story <laughs> is quite an encouragement. Um, you know, for, for our people in general, but particularly uh, you know. African-American females, you know, for, because, you know, they, you know, they say representation is important, Mm -hmm. you know? So, um, so, uh, you know, you've been in our area for a little while now. And, um, so, you know, a lot of folks have, uh, have become uh, familiar with your presence. Um, some know that you are an educator, you are an Mm -hmm. author, been a (laughs) podcast host, Mm -hmm. um, Amongst, Doing it all. <laughs> <laughs> amongst other things, I'm sure. But 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 give us a little background about the black woman, Jayla Woman, leading up to becoming Dr. Woman. What is what is your story? What is the inspiration on your path to becoming Professor Dr. Jayla Woman? Man, I'm gonna try to not give y'all we need more time. <laughs> I was like, Ooh. so first off, I wanna say, um, I, I believe I do have a unique background, as you mentioned, because I come from a military family. So my mm-hmm. dad, retired naval officer, mm-hmm. warrant officer. He was in the Navy for almost th- just about 30 years. Okay. Um, so while my family's from Detroit, um, my mother, my father, me and my siblings, we had the, um, the privilege of growing up overseas, traveling the world. Mm-hmm. Um, so I spent a lot of my upbringing in Hawaii and mm-hmm. Japan, actually. So oh, I was wow. born in Illinois. I'm from mm-hmm. the Midwest, but grew up overseas in Japan. Mm-hmm. That's where I call, called home for the longest. Okay. Because I was there from age 10 to 18. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I did. Now, tell us a little bit about what kind of culture shock that was, though. <laughs> like, was it like, did you stand out like a sore thumb? Like, did you feel like you blended in? Did you feel a sense of community? How, how you was it? Know, everyone always asked me that, especially when. I graduated and moved to the States mm-hmm. to attend college. I believe that's when the culture shock happened. Cause really? you have to remember, I grew up in a military family, mm-hmm. grew up traveling, grew, in, grew up in multicultural environments. Mm-hmm. So living in Japan, we were on a military base um, in Yokosuka, Japan. And I went to high school and middle school, mm-hmm. did sports with students that their parents were in the military, mm-hmm. they worked for the government. So it was always a mixed environment. Um, I don't remember ever feeling like I was out of place. Okay. I just always yeah. felt a sense of community amongst hmm. my peers. Hmm. Everybody looked different, but mm-hmm. we all were the same. Hmm. That's so, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So that's awesome. Yeah, and that's all I knew. So mm-hmm. when I graduated high school and came to Michigan, because that's where we're from, so I applied to um, colleges Mm -hmm. in Michigan. My sister was already attending Eastern Michigan University. So I was like, you know, I'm going to be with my sister. Mm -hmm. So I had applied there as well, got accepted. And it wasn't until I got to Eastern Michigan (laughs) University for undergrad is when I was like, who are these people? I was like, oh, it's different. (laughs) (laughs) To be honest, that was the first time where I was amongst, uh, in in a school environment, or just living where it seemed a little segregated. Yeah, all the black mm. folks hung together uh-huh. at EMU, okay. uh-huh. and that's who I hung with. Right, right. <laughs> so, Things I can imagine on the military base, it was white folk, black folk, Asian, like native folk, native, right, right. Mm-hmm. Hispanic. Okay. Huh, that's interesting. But yeah. when I got to EMU and when I moved to Michigan, I started to understand culture a little bit different mm-hmm. how it is in the united states yeah and how we find our community and tribe a lot of times with people who look like us who talk like us mm-hmm. and who come from similar backgrounds mm-hmm. so me being a black girl at the time young mm-hmm. woman 
I'm like, well, we all look alike. I know I'm African American, but I come from a military family. I grew up in Japan. That's one of the culture shock happened. Yeah, I hear it. So do you do you really think it was that? Do you think you may have been oblivious to the different cultural differences in Japan versus because sometimes mm. when you when you grow when you're kind of incubated in it, you don't recognize mm. that there mm. are differences. Yeah. Yeah. Because your whole life wasn't obviously relegated to the military base. Right. 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 One thing I want to say is my parents did a good job of reminding us that <laughs> uh, Y'all are on the military base. Right. Y'all are in Japan, but y'all okay. are black. Your mm-hmm. parents are okay. from Detroit, Michigan. That helps. They, that helps. you know, <laughs> made it out the mud. Stay rooted. And mm-hmm. they made us know our history. Okay. We watched okay. Roots okay. in the summers. We watched Queen. I don't know if y'all watched them, mm-hmm. them um, documentary, mm-hmm. those movies, miniseries, mm-hmm. Alex Kelly. We would, in the summer, read um, encyclopedias and biographies mm-hmm. of black individuals uh you know inspiring black mm-hmm. men and women mm-hmm. they my parents really wanted us to know yeah, where we yeah. came from awesome. they wanted us to understand that you all are privileged in the sense mm-hmm. that not everyone has this opportunity mm-hmm. to live mm-hmm. overseas to be exposed to these different countries and communities mm-hmm. But your skin color, they're not going to care about mm-hmm. that when you are back mm-hmm. in the United States, mm-hmm. when you guys have to go through your career journey, when you have to mm. go through college. So to mm. your question, I think, you know, at age 10, 12, 15, I'm just having a good time. Yeah, I'm not yeah. thinking about those things. Mm-hmm. But in the back of my head, I knew, okay, people might treat me differently mm-hmm. just because of my history, my heritage. Mm. So when I... Um, came to Michigan for school. I mm-hmm. think I was prepared, okay. but I still had to go through that journey of yeah. discovering who I am, my identity, mm-hmm. trying to figure out where I fit in mm-hmm. um, as an 18 year old now establishing herself back in the United States mm-hmm. and going through that young adult process that everyone does go right, through right. in college. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that says a lot about uh, the Hawaiian people because, you know, like I'm not, you know, like as familiar or as, you know, educated on if there is a sense of like discrimination, segregation, mm-hmm. if there's a history of racism, but it, but, but it speaks a lot, it speaks volumes that your parents didn't have to teach you to assimilate. Sound, sounded like they taught you about self-respect to be proud of who oh, you were. Absolutely. And at the same time, you, like you said, you still felt like, Hey, like this, this is my people. This is my community. Yeah. You know, so my think- parents definitely always taught us about, you need to know who you are, mm. who you are, who you come from, where you come from. We are raised in church, you mm-hmm. know. So I think that gave us, me and my siblings, I have a sister and a brother. It really gave us a good foundation. Mm-hmm. So no matter what we would encounter mm. once we left um, Japan, mm-hmm. once we left Hawaii, we were prepared to an extent, of course, mm, yeah. Uh what everyone else, I guess what my peers back in the U.S., we would say the States, Mm -hmm. what my Mm -hmm. peers back in the States were experiencing, my cousins, Mm -hmm. you know, who lived in Detroit and Cleveland. Like my parents didn't want us to uh, feel like we were ever better than anyone Mm -hmm. or that we, you know, like they want us to really understand y'all uncles, aunties, cousins, Mm -hmm. they all in the Midwest and Detroit and Cleveland. Mm -hmm. So you're having this experience and it was cool because they would always send family to come visit us okay. regardless of where we were. So whoever could, they had an opportunity to come overseas. Mm-hmm. My cousins always came um, to either Hawaii, Japan, even Virginia when we lived in Virginia for a time. Mm-hmm. So mm. it's been a really good experience. Like okay. my military upbringing really did shape who I am. It shaped mm. I think how I approached education and okay. what I wanted to study. Gotcha. And that was going to be my next question is where, so where did the trek towards being an educator come in? Uh, you know, does your family have a history of teachers or like, where did that passion come in at? So the passion actually wasn't education. <laughs> okay. Okay. Break it down for me. Break it down for me, doctor. <laughs> the passion was, I think communication. Okay. okay. Yeah. Like when I think back to my, um, High school is when I really can recall enjoying language and writing. I excelled in all my English classes. To this Mm -hmm. day, my um, 
my English teacher from high school or friends on Facebook. Mm-hmm. She follows, she has followed my journey. Mm-hmm. She comments on all of my accomplishments. So awesome. I remember when I would think about like what I wanted to study and what mm-hmm. I wanted to go to school for. I was like, mm, I'm not really that passionate about mm-hmm. much, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I love communicating. I love mm-hmm. helping people. I okay. love inspiring others. I love encouraging people. So writing came natural. Mm-hmm. Um, any form of communication. I remember in high school, I did like a work study at the um, the Naval, the magazine that they had, uh, the newspaper that they had. And I kind of interned there for mm-hmm. a summer. I actually, in high school, came to D.C. at American mm-hmm. University and I did a summer program where I was learning about journalism and news writing. So all throughout high school, I was really exploring what mm-hmm. is it about communication mm-hmm. that I do enjoy. Mm-hmm. So when it was time to choose a major and what I wanted to study, I could figure out, is it journalism? Is it teaching? Is it, um, you know, broadcast mm-hmm. journalism? Mm-hmm. Like, what is it? Mm-hmm. Um, so... I just loved everything. Yeah. So yeah. When I That's got to EMU, right? yeah, when I got to Eastern Michigan, I mean, I changed my major a few times because I also mentioned that I love helping mm-hmm. people. So I was like, mm-hmm. do mm-hmm. I want to be a nurse or psychologist? Right. Knowing good and well, science was girl, health, girl, health. zodiac sign. <laughs> health and science Let me was tell you. I'm airy. <laughs> <laughs> health and science was not. Well, I was like, maybe I could be a psychologist. Mm-hmm. Maybe I could be a counselor. And then I was like, mm-hmm. let me just to what I was good at. I didn't mm -hmm. know where that was going to take me, Mm -hmm. but I was like, I've always just enjoyed communicating with others. So I uh, actually chose English literature and language. It was an interdisciplinary type Mm -hmm. of major, Mm -hmm. but it was Mm -hmm. centered on the English language and language and writing. And then I minored in communication and media arts. So I got to do everything Mm -hmm. in my undergrad so I Mm -hmm. could figure out what it is I really wanted to do in terms of, um, you know, communications. Yeah. And so it sounds like you like to talk. I love to talk. <laughs> That's why I'm I mean, here. <laughs> That's pretty much. And through that is where I discovered I love writing. Yeah. So okay. my journey to becoming a, a professional writer and a professor, that's where it began. Mm. Um, and yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. like I thought, Max, I thought she was going to throw a preacher in there mm-hmm. because you mentioned church and helping people. Well, I was like, oh, you know, well, that's, 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 that's how we yeah. got it. So, <laughs> so because I was raised in church, mm-hmm. um, actually, when I came to uh, college, a lot of people are always surprised when I say, I actually, I wasn't the girl who was like wild and out. Of course, mm-hmm. I went to a few parties because. Mm-hmm. That's where you get your little dose of freedom. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I came from a military family. So, mm-hmm. you know, my parents, my dad did not play. Mm-hmm. And to this day, don't play. <laughs> uh, I'm his baby girl, as he loves calling. Oh, there you go. But um, there you go. I was in the gospel choir. Mm-hmm. I uh, I led Bible studies. I was part mm-hmm. of, like, Bible study organizations. Mm-hmm. Um, I just did a little bit of everything, yeah, yeah. but I made sure I stay rooted and grounded in my faith because that's all go. I knew. And yeah, I knew that's that that's what my parents instilled in us. And mm-hmm. I was like, regardless of what I do in college right. and what I do on this journey I'm on, mm-hmm. I don't want to lose that uh, mm-hmm. foundation mm-hmm. because I had positive experiences mm-hmm. with church. And when I started to be around a faith community in um, college, that's where I developed like a relationship. Okay. So it wasn't mm. for me yeah. ever about religion. Yeah. Mm, I like to that. this day, yeah. I mean, you know, I ha- I have a church. I've had multiple churches, mm-hmm. but to me, it's always been about relationship mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. having a personal walk in a relationship. Mm-hmm. So when I graduated, I had I was at a crossroads my senior year. I was like, do I want to teach? Or do I want to go to ministry school? Mm, mm, yep. Yep. Okay. So I applied to Teach for America, which is like uh, AmeriCorps. Mm-hmm. And I also applied to go to vocational uh, Bible college. Because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that's what I was interested in. Mm-hmm. Both of those things, mm-hmm. either teaching or, um, you know, developing my ministerial voice. And yeah. 
really having a good solid understanding of the word mm -hmm. and i remember praying about this and i was like if i don't get into the teach for america program and if i get into the bible college i'm going to go to minister school okay. so i made it to the second round to teach for america mm -hmm. to teach english mm -hmm. and then they were like unfortunately you know, we are not going to be moving forward with you. So that was my sign that mm. God want me to go to ministry. Uh oh, school. Mm -hmm. okay. So There's I a call it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> don't let me start preaching on here on this good evening. Huh? But um, I did that for two years. Yep, I mm -hmm. went for pastoral and disciplinary studies mm -hmm. in the cornfields of Columbus, Ohio, mm -hmm. and that was that was the the place that really grounded me, I would say. Okay. Mm. On all levels, career and personal. Mm -hmm. Like mm. that's where God really helped me to see that you are called and to be a light in the world. It's not just in the four walls mm. of the church. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. can use you mm. anywhere. Okay. So when I got there, I'm thinking I, I'm going to be there and I'm going to be just learning the word of God, learning mm -hmm. how to preach, whatever. Mm -hmm. But I got hired within a few weeks to be an assistant writer for really? the church. Okay. That nice. was um, over that Bible college. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I never thought that God was going to use my English degree mm -hmm. yeah, while yeah. I was in Bible college. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cause that's not where I went for. Right, right. Hey. But they said we looked because I had to apply for work study to have okay. like a little stipend. Work study was like, working in the prayer center, <laughs> working with the mm -hmm. kids at yeah. church, different things like that. Mm -hmm. They said, we looked at your application. We see you have a degree in English. Mm -hmm. And the um, pastor, he is looking for a writer to join his team. Okay, That is how I got my first professional writing experience. Okay. Look at God. Being I know. a copywriter and a copy editor. Mm -hmm. For two years. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. So that's, yeah, that's why the word says, be ye ready. Yes. You know, and, and you, you're ready. <laughs> or, or, or on the streets, we say, if you stay ready, you ain't got to get if ready. If you stay ready, you have to get ready. And yeah, yeah, that experience. So while I'm there getting my ministerial experience and learning, you know, just more about who I am and the word, I'm also mm -hmm. getting this professional writing experience. Mm -hmm. And that is when I decided I want to go back and get my master's mm -hmm. so I could teach people this technical writing because technical my writing. background was really in like mm -hmm. English language mm -hmm. and it wasn't in professional writing, writing for businesses. Cause I was like copy editing for websites. I was mm -hmm. writing donor letters. I mean, I was writing um, all kinds of materials mm -hmm. to the, the missions. Mm -hmm. I was reading the pastor's books and I was a, uh, writing copy teaching mm -hmm. series i was yeah. a part of that team mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it was a learning curve mm -hmm. but i taught myself yeah yeah, yeah. so are you saying it's that you a pastor too <laughs> <laughs> pastor well, 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 y'all well. call me uh mr warren <laughs> yeah. I mean, those those yeah. so, all right so so now you know, as, as we said earlier, in family, we are talking to none other than Dr. Jayla Warman. Yes. So we mentioned earlier, you know, like about your trek and your experiences. Mm -hmm. So is this where you started looking at Virginia? Started, so, started you know, like so post um, that uh, master's program. Is that when this side of the country came into play? Well, this, this side of the country had come into play. Yeah, around that time, because mm -hmm. I went back to get my master's. And at that point, I'm thinking I'm going to go into just a professional career. I could work for a communications department, either mm -hmm. in an educational setting, um, you know, like in a department at a university or just a professional organization of business. Because um, I was like, I now have this skill set mm -hmm. that could be used anywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but my parents... When we left, when I left Japan, my dad and my mom, they left a year later and moved to Bowie, Maryland, PG County. So okay. that's where he ended up retiring. Gotcha. So I would go back home and visit, you know, every, uh, every year when we had breaks from college. Mm -hmm. So that area, the mm -hmm. DMV area was always okay. on my yeah, mind. About the East Coast. Yeah. Like okay. the East coast was always mm -hmm. like, I ain't never seen successful black folks mm -hmm, out mm -hmm, here. Mm -hmm. I've never, you know, it, it just was so beautiful. I loved the DMV. I loved the East coast in general. 
And we had lived in Virginia for a brief, when I was like seven or eight, my mm -hmm. dad was stationed out um, uh, in Yorktown area. So I was already familiar just with this region. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't until my mentors and professors mm -hmm. during my master's program encouraged me to apply the doctoral programs. They were like, you kind of would be a good professor because you love to do all the things a professor does. Mm -hmm. They're like, you like the writing, mm -hmm. the speaking, mm -hmm. the research, the mentoring, the yeah, teaching. Yeah. They okay. were like, all the things. Look at all that stuff you said you were interested yes. in. Yeah, <laughs> all rolled up into but one. Okay. At the time, I was just like, mm, that mm -hmm. wasn't on my mind. Right, right, right. I was like, you're yeah, a doctor. Like mm -hmm. nobody in my family mm -hmm. I knew had a doctorate. Mm -hmm. um, so once I, you know, took the advice and I applied to Michigan State, I got mm -hmm. in fully funded. Okay. Yeah, fully funded. I, we like that. Fully funded, and my master's program was fully funded too. And that's okay. how I like to tell people. Now, since y'all know I'm a minister, <laughs> I like to tell people when doors look. when doors open for hey. you, mm -hmm. that's a sign that you are on the path and you are on the journey that God has destined for you mm -hmm. because you are not going to have to force that door open. Mm. When you feel like you're having to force it open, when you're feeling like mm -hmm. you pull, pull in tooth and nail, mm -hmm. it either is not mm -hmm. your time mm -hmm. or that's not the door he has for you. Mm -hmm. So my educational journey, preach. Preach, although preach, yeah. the work has not been easy, he's opened every door. There you go. I've had to do my part. Mm -hmm. But when I tell you, God has really just like showed mm -hmm. me this is a path. And when I have done my due diligence and working hard, late mm -hmm. hours, studying, writing, researching, mm -hmm. the doors have opened. Mm -hmm. So mm, that's a this region thing. was, um, now that I'm in my PhD program and going through that process, I, I felt like, yeah, a professor is what I want to do. Not mm -hmm. everyone who gets a doctorate becomes a professor, mm -hmm. but I felt like that was my calling. Mm -hmm. So I had my sight on this region. Mm -hmm. um, I did apply to schools in California, and that okay. was just kind of like dreamy. You know, mm -hmm. everybody always be like, mm -hmm. I want to go out <laughs> West Coast. But in reality, I knew I wanted to be yeah. on this side of the country. Okay, mm. okay Miss Hawaii. Talk about <laughs> I, wanted, I knew I wanted to be on the East Coast. <laughs> I don't want to go to the islands and the palm trees. <laughs> Almost over here where it's humid. <laughs> no, but uh, so so, Doctor Woman. So if if I understand your story correctly, this brings us to a, a, a pivotal part of the conversation, and also sort of a glorious new age for for yourself as well. Because yes. one thing that Max and I talk a lot about is you know when, when we talk about representation and our heritage and our culture and our accountability and responsibility to each other. Mm -hmm. um, when we get into the educational realm of that conversation, mm -hmm. we talk about the importance of our historic places yeah. and our historic monuments, HBCUs being one. Yeah. Now, so let's get into the this sort of phase of your life on where, for those who don't know, you were a full-time professor of technical writing mm -hmm. at James Madison University. Yes. Right, you mm -hmm. know, across the mountain in, uh, in, in, in Harrisonburg. Yeah. Right, so PWI, predominantly mm -hmm. white institution. Mm -hmm. So you're very cultured. You have lived experiences mm -hmm. you know from uh from being in multicultural diverse areas um so you have made a decision mm -hmm. to move on to the next phase of your career and i'll let yeah. you introduce what that is mm -hmm. and then i know max gonna have some questions about why you made that choice but go ahead and and, and announce yeah. to the world you know your you know like where you are now professionally yes yeah, so for the last three years i've been working as a technical writer um teaching technical communication mm -hmm. and rhetoric at James Madison University. But I recently have accepted a position to be an assistant professor of English and writing mm -hmm. at the Howard University. Oh, wow. Okay. So I will be starting um, at Howard University in the fall. Congratulations. In just a month or so. Hey, I can't yeah. believe. Right around the corner. It's right around the corner. <laughs> and it is a big, a big step, mm -hmm. a big move, and I'm really excited for it. Yeah. So what yeah. help us to put together the pieces as far as the, the jump again, uh, JMU to Howard, 
<laughs> yeah, there's a lot there. There's a lot there. Yes. Yeah, so now that you all know my background mm -hmm. and my experience, um, one of the areas that I've researched because as a doctor, I have to do research. Okay. Um, I'm a tenure track professor, mm -hmm. so I've you know done extensive research and writing. And in my area of professional technical communication, I've always been interested in the ways that language and writing happens okay. in Black communities, mm. in professional settings, mm. in businesses, organizations, and online. Mm. So that has been the realm that I focus on culture and writing. Okay. Um, but specifically for our people, because we know historically there's always been a gap, whether it's in business, whether it is in entrepreneurship, the struggle for generational wealth, mm -hmm. we've had to work 10 times as hard. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure I am bridging the gap and thinking about the ways that writing happens mm -hmm. um, and how black language influences the way writing happens in mm -hmm. professional settings for black folks. Mm -hmm. So my research for my dissertation mm -hmm. looked at um, design practices okay. and language practices for black women entrepreneurs mm -hmm. on social media, social mm -hmm. networking sites. So I had the opportunity to interview amazing black women entrepreneurs thinking mm -hmm. about how they bring identity to their work, mm -hmm. but not just their work, but how they brand themselves. Okay. I'm always interested in thinking about how we brand ourselves mm -hmm. and how we show up. And do we feel like we have to hide our identity mm -hmm when it comes to communication mm -hmm. in the workplace, in our writing, mm. in our design. Mm -hmm. So because that has been my interest and what I teach, I even taught that in, at JMU, design okay. and culture. Okay. I um, How do folks deal with that? Well, I, uh, <laughs> propose, I proposed this class for my department. I was like, you know, we need a class that looks at cultural writing practices yeah. in professional settings and technical communication, writing and design because it is not a standardized approach. Mm -hmm. There is design that is design and professional writing is taught standardized because mm -hmm. you have to know how to write a memo. And there are, uh, you know, different things that we are taught how you craft a flyer mm -hmm. and how you craft an ad mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. you know, television or um, a billboard. But the question I pose to my students is, what happens when you need to reach a specific audience? Right. And how right. do you know the cultural markers, the cultural cultural cues of that mm -hmm. audience? And we have to be mm -hmm. aware of that because mm -hmm. when we don't, we already know what has happened. Advertisements and we people get canceled. So because that has been my mm -hmm. interest and passion, mm -hmm. getting back to your question, mm -hmm. I have always wanted to make sure I'm empowering the next generation, empowering my people. Mm -hmm. And when I think about HBCUs, um, historically, there has not been a very strong technical and professional writing mm -hmm. uh, program at there. HBCUs. Yeah. So before before we do, though, OK, so I have two questions and I have to back up a little bit mm -hmm. to get there. But uh, the first being you said that black language um, has an influence or impact on writing. Right. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to get you to kind of unpack that a little bit. And then in listening to you talk just now, this is gonna, might be a little bit out of left field, but we have all at some point throughout mm -hmm. our life um, heard people say or that black people kind of we set the bar. We are the 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 bar, you know, mm -hmm. like so I'm wondering when you talk about language and writing and branding and different things like that. If you are, if if those things have to be developed in a way to reach a specific group of people, mm -hmm. or does it have to be designed in a way to reach black people? Mm. And then if it reaches us, it kind of reaches everyone. You know, I may not have mm -hmm. formed that really nicely, but do you get the mm -hmm. idea of what I'm, yeah. I'm saying? I'm going to see your first question. Okay. And then that's the, these are really great questions. Um, so to your first point, we all have probably heard the term mm -hmm. Ebonics mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you you when you're speaking mm -hmm. or writing, um, you need to speak professionally mm -hmm. or what we would say. There's a standardized way of writing communications. Yeah. So historically, that term Ebonics or what we call Ave, African-American mm -hmm. vernacular English mm -hmm. 
was considered, you know, bad language. Yeah, of course. But so many researchers and scholars, such as Dr. Geneva Smitherman mm -hmm. and my mentor, Dr. Um, April Baker Bell, have done studies mm -hmm. on no, like this is not bad language. Mm -hmm. This is not thank you for bad telling English, me that. I'm using know, it in the office. Tomorrow. Ave, um, <laughs> this is a cultural yeah. phenomenon. Okay. African American rhetorical practices. Okay. Even linguists have studied this. Okay. So uh, that's its whole area of study mm -hmm. that um, Black language learners and scholars have done extensive research to mm -hmm. dispel that myth mm -hmm. and that stereotype. Mm -hmm. So because I've studied under, um, you know, some of the best and I got exposed to that, even though my focus has been on technical communication mm -hmm. and writing, I want, I think it has helped me to understand that all language is powerful. Mm -hmm. All dialects are powerful. That's right. That's right. So I have been on my own journey of coming into how do I want to show up in the workplace? Mm -hmm. How do I want to represent myself mm -hmm. professionally? That's true to who I am. Right, right. And I'm not saying that Black is a monolith and we all sound alike, talk alike, because mm -hmm. growing up, they would be like, you sound like an Oreo. <laughs> you know, you an Oreo. You sound like a white girl. And uh -huh. I had to deal with that. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like I said, growing, having to come to a sense of who I am mm -hmm. and my identity. But with the research and the work I am doing, I trying to get to your second question, mm -hmm. where I want to teach people, mm -hmm. whether it's black students, whether it's brown students, white students, is you're going to always have to cater to a specific audience mm -hmm. in your workforce, in the workplace, mm -hmm. since I deal with mostly professional writing or people who are going to go out into industry in the mm -hmm. workplace. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to teach them is you need to be prepared and equipped with the tools and the skill sets right. where you understand the demographic, you mm -hmm. understand your audience, and you could design anything that's going to reach them. You mm -hmm. understand the vision, mm -hmm. the mission, and the goals. Mm -hmm. That's what we teach in professional and technical communication. What's the mission, the vision, the goals? Who is my audience? What right. do they look like? What is the age group? Mm -hmm. You know, all of this. And that's how you can better yeah. craft your message, whether it is, you know, a flyer, whether this is a professional document, mm -hmm. whether... It's an essay. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not trying to tell people that, oh, you could just go out and write yeah. any kind of way. Because right. that's the first critique. Mm -hmm. A lot of folks will be like, oh, so are you, are you saying mm -hmm. we don't have to have mm -hmm. any kind of standardization? Mm -hmm. I'm like, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just saying there shouldn't just be one. Right. Yeah. And that's the whole point of communication. Yeah. Right? It's like, yeah, you know, the audience is depends on how you communicate. Right? And for yeah. so yeah. long, though we have been taught that there's only one way mm -hmm. to speak and write. Right. Yeah. And I'm trying to, to teach my students, you need to understand who it is I'm trying to reach. And if you're going into a professional setting, what mm -hmm. are the goals mm -hmm. of our organization for this, whether it's a brand campaign or whether your you know department organization has mm -hmm. a specific goal and you are the writer you are the designer mm -hmm. um so you'll be equipped with those skill sets so yeah, yeah. a part of me wanting to go to howard also was understanding um that there's not as many programs when it comes to professional communication design and the interdisciplinary approach mm -hmm. that i take but knowing mm -hmm. some of the best students attend right. HBCU. Hey, so. yeah, and I want to make sure that I'm teaching some of the best and brightest students. Mm -hmm. yeah, and course. I'm excited mm -hmm. for this transition. Yeah, you got a proud HBCU mama over there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, as, as we kind of draw to a, to a close, I, you know, a couple more things on my mind, Max. Um, one is, uh, you know, We've had this conversation with, with with people when it comes to making decisions between PWIs and HBCUs, whether mm -hmm. it's a student or whether it's to be a part of the faculty and staff. Mm -hmm. And some of sometimes the reasons that we get is people could have the objective to educate um, based on, you know, I'll say African American studies. Mm -hmm. You know, just just to if if you can use that as a general concept, but some people have the mindset of that 
they could do, they can have more impact mm-hmm. at a PWI because they're kind of like, well, that's the population who really needs to more. understand. So I'm curious. So I'm curious if, if you feel like that you've done that sector already by already being at GMU and now it's like, okay, now I'm going to go to my people and make sure like mm-hmm. that we are empowered as well. Um, so that's one. The number two is, do you think you're going to get the same level of support? Like, let's be honest, like, mm-hmm. like, like Max just said, yeah. and you can even share your thoughts on that as deep as you want to, but you know, funding is an issue a lot of times. Yeah. And, you know, and of course there could be different reasons for that. Um, but we know that, that we got to do better, you know, like when it comes yeah. to upholding and, and having quality, from top to bottom of HBCU, the same way they are at PWI. So, so, so I know I asked two questions. <laughs> Hopefully you got those. But, yeah, yeah. So I think that it all comes down to your goals mm-hmm. and where you see yourself and what you want to do. Mm-hmm. So of course I could have continued to, you know, stay at JMU and I love my, my colleagues and it, it was really a great, environment and it is a good environment for me coming out of my um, PhD mm-hmm. early career mm-hmm. you know they gave me the opportunity to kind of um, take my research and develop mm-hmm. classes and to really teach the way I want it um, and I kind of was comfortable actually mm-hmm. I would say that mm-hmm. but I knew there because you were talking about impact so when yeah, you know yeah. you're yeah, where's the bigger impact when you know that you are one of few or the exactly. only mm-hmm. you definitely can have an impact but i never want to be the token anywhere mm. yeah. that's never been mm. for me my calling i've never mm-hmm. felt that i was called <laughs> i always tell people i Not never because <laughs> I, I have a lot of friends um who cool. are in higher yeah. ed and who are a part of dei initiatives mm-hmm. and they right. are that person i just personally never felt like that was my role yeah or my place mm-hmm. i was like i'm coming here to teach students to be better communicators mm-hmm. to be better um industry specialists mm-hmm. I'm trying to help them get jobs mm-hmm. and to go out and to be leaders. Mm-hmm. Like that's that's my calling mm-hmm. to mentor, to inspire, mm-hmm. to empower wherever I'm at. And I think that's why I could, God could have me at a PWI JMU in the Shenandoah Valley, mm-hmm. and I was I was okay, yeah. but I knew it wasn't gonna be forever. Uh, I knew mm-hmm. I, I needed a little a, a little culture. Right. <laughs> I was missing, you know, mm-hmm. my people and. Mm-hmm. I believe that's why that you would come to Charlottesville. That is yeah. why I, <laughs> yeah. and I'm so happy I met you, Charles, that you introduced me Thank to you. BPN, Black Professional Network. I really felt like being surrounded by other Black professionals here in Charlottesville mm-hmm. helped me have a sense of community just living in this region, in the Shenandoah Valley area. Mm. Um, but I feel like mm-hmm. I will have just as much impact or even more, to be honest, mm-hmm. um, at Howard mm-hmm. because I understand the field I'm going into when it comes to writing and communication. Mm -hmm. And I know what I bring to the table and I know my research is needed. My approach is needed. We are in a digital age now. We are, you know, Mm -hmm. AI is on the table. And I want to make sure even with AI and other digital tools that I'm able to teach students and my black students um, how to still navigate writing Mm -hmm. and technology Mm -hmm. um so they are as competitive as their peers as Mm -hmm. they are just as knowledgeable when they go Mm -hmm. on the job market and when they graduate because we have a lot of those programs already at pwis Mm -hmm. and um you know with the funding you both mentioned Mm -hmm. they have those departments already developed so Mm -hmm. that Sometimes is the the lack that we see at HBCUs, some of those mm-hmm. new um, digital technologies and departments right, right. and programs. So mm-hmm. I bring a wealth of knowledge and a mm-hmm. disciplinary research. And that's where I want to go now and help some of the brightest and best students mm-hmm. that are going to go out into the workforce and bring my yeah. talents there. Yeah. But you. are you concerned yeah. about there being a lack of resource, like compared yeah. to where you are coming from. But she is still going to the Howard. So. Yeah. HU? Yeah. Okay. Max trying to start something. No, okay. I'm not concerned. Mm-hmm. I am 
aware of the differences Mm -hmm. and types of institutions. Mm -hmm. I'm aware. And I think it's just going to be another season of growth Mm -hmm. and me Mm -hmm. learning how to navigate another job in a new environment. Like that's, that's what I'm aware of, Mm -hmm. you know? So we gonna see. Yeah, we gonna <laughs> see. I mean, I yeah. think that's all I can say <laughs> about it. We gonna and, and I'm gonna do. I'm gonna right. do the best that I can do, and well, I'm I'll not, figure I'm it not. out because yeah. I always do. Yeah. With God on my side, mm-hmm. there you go. There you go. And my yeah. colleagues. Yeah. <laughs> but well, thank you for sharing yes, your indeed. perspective on the PWI versus HBCU, and I think your comments are really important to that debate or conversation. I I feel like people, especially Black people feel like they're in this, they, they have to make a hard decision, you know, and, and they feel compelled to almost always pick HBCU over PWI because just because you're supposed to by mm. default of being black. Mm. Yeah. Um, and what an individual ought to be able to do is make their own personal choices based on their goals yeah. and the path that they desire for themselves. Yeah, and what they so, feel like they need. So. Mm-hmm. Like if you feel like you need in that moment or you're desiring mm-hmm. not only an excellent education, but that sense of community mm-hmm. to help you and shape you, then, you know, go where you're going to get mm-hmm. that. If that's mm-hmm. at the HBCU, then, you know, I even wish... At the time, I didn't really know much about mm-hmm. HBCUs living in Japan. Mm-hmm. I went where we were from. We were mm-hmm. from Michigan. Mm-hmm. That's that's kind of how a lot of people did it. Yeah. You know, my peers, we went where our families. To what you knew. Yeah, where our families mm-hmm. were, um, where sense. we had residencies mm-hmm. at. So all my friends in Michigan, yeah. too, we are all like, man, if we had HBCUs closer, if there was more of that present, because we come from Big Ten mm-hmm. territory, mm-hmm. University of Michigan. Mm-hmm. Michigan State, like Midwest, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think regionally, it's also like exposure, because mm-hmm. um, yeah. that debate gonna go on, right? You know, people even right. try to come for me. I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> don't come for me right, right. <laughs> yeah and, and i am by no means telling people to in some way to turn your backs on the hbcus <laughs> and you know i'm not saying that at all what i'm saying is that an individual ought to be able to make yeah. their own personal decision and not be, be feel forced to make one just yeah. because mm. of societal issues i believe you'll get an excellent education um whatever school you choose mm-hmm. But your experience will be different. Yeah. So mm. those are things you need to take into account. Mm, You're yeah. going to have different experiences. So those are the conversations you need to have with yourself, with your family mm. as you're making those decisions. And as a faculty member, that's what I'm aware mm. of. My experience at JMU has been good, but it also has been different mm. because I am one of few mm-hmm. working there. And because I come from a military family, I was able to adapt but now i'm ready for a change mm-hmm. and, and that is why um, i'm excited mm-hmm. for where i'm going that's awesome that's awesome dr jayla warman thank you for joining <laughs> us now uh, you know as we said you have authored uh you have hosted your own podcast so yeah. let the folks know how to reach you if they want to learn more uh, yeah. and, and, and wants to contact you so if you want to learn more about my research, my writing, um, you can follow my website, jaylawarman.com. I am active on social media. I mean, I just talked about digital technologies. So you can follow me on Instagram, on TikTok, mm-hmm. Dr. J. Warman, W-O-U-R-M-A-N. And in the fall, you can look out for my podcast, Just a Minute with Jayla. Mm, okay. Okay. Good stuff. Well, yeah. continue success and uh, please, please touch base with us after you get all settled in and I let will. us know how it's going. I'm going to have to bring you on the show. Okay, please. <laughs> please do. Please do. We're ready. You hear that, Max? We're going to have an HU audience. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs>